welcome. Welcome one and all, whether here or afar. And thank you for bringing yourself here. Bringing your living, thinking, feeling, wondering self to this shared space and time. My name is Michael Dadson. I'm a Unitarian minister. My wife, Julie, is sitting here, keeping an eye on me. Um, and I am, and we are both delighted to be back here with you in Plymouth. Please do stay afterwards, those here physically, for refreshment and conversation. If the rest of you start now, you'll get, but you'll miss the service, so don't. Do stay on for a, a chance to connect over a cuppa, for some refreshment, some conversation, talk with one another, and perhaps compare notes about what you might be taking away from this service. And so we begin. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Starting here, what do you want to carry through the day and into the evening from this interval spent together? Thank you, Steve. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Here we step out of time and out of the traces of our tethered living into the timeless, the untrammeled life of the soul. Here we dis discover and rediscover yet again the identity of soul, which allows us to live in a complex world without fearing it or fighting it. Here we come to drink from the source which nourishes us and which nourishes the core being living at the center of our lives. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near, gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near.
And so we are gathered. Now let me set the scene for this morning and welcome to those who've come in since I said welcome before, especially someone about to arrive. Just holding off so I don't leave somebody out. Good morning to you and welcome. Now, the Tao Te Ching, in one of its more challenging moods, um, chapter 29, if you don't spot it for yourself, says this. Do you want to improve the world? I don't think it can be done. The world is sacred. It can't be improved. That could be an entire service on its own. That could be a lengthy workshop. That could be a series of discussions. But I've only shared it here to focus our minds on the question that I want to explore with you this morning. How are we to look at the world around us as it really is? Ranging from delight to despair, ranging from beauty to horror, ranging from loving kindness to heartless cruelty. How are we supposed to look at that? And I'm going to consider three ways of looking. Three windows, if you will, the round one, the, no. The windows of faith and hope and love, but as I do that, I'm going to keep touching on an underlying theme, an accompanying strap line, if you will, less is more. Faith and hope and love, but less is more. And on that note, uh, a procedural note now, I should warn you that this is a sermon-less service. Please don't wait anxiously for an address to come along, because it won't, which may mean you have to keep those sweeties for next week. Faith, then. You may know, some or all, that I do some work for Unitarian College, training our ministers for the future. And one of the things that we ask of them, well, the work we do is all built on something that I'm sure you know very, very well, the ministerial competencies. Have you all got a copy with you? I doubt, no. This is, if you like, the map of ministry upon which we based our curriculum for training, which was created some years ago by the MSG, the Monos Ministerial Strategy Group. And the second of all the competencies, the second thing that ministers and ministers in training are asked to engage with is this. Clearly understand and be able to articulate a personal theology your personal beliefs in the light of current and changing thought. In other words, can you say what you believe? Now, at the very first time we gather new students for training for their orientation, the first thing I ask them to do is to articulate in writing what they personally believe. And in order to, to make the task a bit manageable, because being ministers in training and being Unitarians, they're liable to go on at some length. So I say, let's just contain the task and maybe give it a hint of fun by saying, please write this down in 111 words, 111. And if nothing else, that focuses the thinking. I wonder what each of you might say, what each of you might write if I said, here's a piece of paper and a pen, use 111 words to articulate your personal credo, whatever it is. I'm not going to do that today, but you might want to make a mental note and go away and just try that for fun. But with the students, we don't only ask them that one time at orientation. You'll note the phrase, in the light of current and changing thought. Every month thereafter, while they're in our hands, we ask them to, to complete a monthly reflection on their experiences of those past few weeks, looking at their personal life, their spiritual life, their time management, their health, their family, the balance of their living as they move into ministry. And part of that each month is to look back at their personal credo and just check, is it still current? And what's a lovely thing to do is to see it 
changing, evolving, deepening, going in unexpected directions to remain relevant to the experiences they're having and the thinking that they are doing. Now, the message in that about faith is that faith in our Unitarian tradition is understood to be individual, to be personal. I must try not to breathe into the microphone. I'll try to breathe, but not into the microphone. Faith in our tradition is understood to be personal and individual, and therefore various amongst us all, rather than fixed and corporate. Faith in our Unitarian tradition is understood to be subject to change. As prompted by events, by changing circumstances, as prompted by ongoing personal reflection and prayer and formation. In this setting, the setting we all share, where we celebrate open mindedness and we welcome changing thought, I have a couple of worries about holding on to a fixed, formal, collective faith system. One is that it can be easy to slip into making comparisons between different systems and then into competition about which one works a bit better than another or which works best, about which one is more right than any other. So division and opposition can arise in the name of what? And my other worry is the faith which seeks to explain life and the universe and everything, which purports to offer a solution to the puzzles and the challenges of life, can easily become a comfort blanket in which to wrap up against the uncomfortable realities of the world around us, a form of protection, a reason or an excuse not to engage with the world and all that therein lies, because it's not always easy, is it? In those terms, then, in the perspective of a fixed and defined faith, I urge us all to be faithless. Rather to be courageously open to the realities of the life that we really have, the world we really inhabit, and then to be faithfully true to it and to ourselves. To keep good faith with life and with our living of it. Thinking about faith, let's sing the hymn number 136 for those of you clutching a hymn book.
well done all who had a go at that one. Um, with the, the blessings of using CDs, recorded hymns and, and using Zoom as well, um, I chose that for the first time ever. And it's rather appropriate because it was written by Michael Dorney, who was the organist at the first Unitarian congregation we ever attended in Bournemouth. As you can tell from the, the music, he was a musician's musician and an organist's organist, a very creative man. And, and thank you for having a go at that. I wanted the words, though, very much. Thank you. Faith, then hope. How are we to look at this world, this real world, with hope? And I did see one or two nods there. I hope that Exeter Chiefs have a better season next time round. Um, I hope for good weather on my birthday tomorrow. But in neither case can my hoping, however fervent, have any effect. But when we look at problems, we look at situations around us, don't we long for some hope to hold on to? And when those are problems that we have no control over, situations in which we simply have no agency, what hope can we realistically frame and then hold? How are we to look at that? And what do we do with our feelings of helplessness? It's tempting to come up with a hope. I hope that. It'll all be okay. But to set up a hope to hang on to, though again, like a fixed faith system is quite comforting, it creates an expectation, which may not come to fruition, and instead may bring disappointment, regret, disillusionment. And, and when our hands are gripped tightly around that chosen hope, they are closed to other possibilities. They are closed to the responding touch of others who may bring hope to us if we are open to it. From that perspective then, in terms of a cherished outcome to which we may become wedded to the exclusion of other possibilities, may we endeavour to be hopeless. Rather, to be hopeful people, with emphasis on the being. Rather, to be courageously open to hope, which isn't limited by our specifications and our expectations. In our way of being, let us simply be of good hope. And I'm going to open up some time now reflective time for all of us to think and feel and explore. Be open to the unlikely possibilities of hope unknown, unrecognised, unpredictable. There's a verse by Emily Dickinson first, then some quiet music to reflect along with, and then some words by Mary Oliver to close off this reflective time, thinking of hope un unknown. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel hope or joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns being destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind. And much can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is a way of fighting back, that sometimes 
something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. It is not made to be a crumb. Again, I'm taking the invitation of pre-recorded music to choose a hymn by a musician's musician, David Dawson. Um, this hymn, which does speak about the joy of hope. It's, if you're clutching a book, it's the hymn number 217, Winds Be Still. Just so you know this isn't thrown together randomly that hymn fly bird of hope the music at the very beginning of the guitar music was called birds flew over the spire and the interlude music was called the swan by patrick hawes see the seamless connection between all of these things so now love is is he going to urge us all to be loveless then to carry on this theme what am I going to do about love? What might it mean to look at our world and to feel love when there is so much to be seen that is more detestable than lovely? Love, does it imply accepting, acceptance, just glossing over things we don't like in, in, in someone or in something because we're trying to be loving? in our friendships, in our families, in our communities, there is acceptance of less lovely traits in one another because we are being loving. But by trying to look lovingly at this world of ours, does that mean we need to look with tolerance, with acceptance, with approval? How could that be? But the word approval there speaks thought it, it's a reaction it's a verdict coming from the mind my thought about love here is that it is not a matter for the mind to understand not a matter of thought at all from that perspective from that point of view i want to urge us to seek a way of being which is open-hearted as well as open-minded and open-handed not being loveless, but a way of being loving in the world which is not intentional, not artful, but artless. No, no, not heartless, but artless, flowing from an open and defenceless heart, a loving way of being which is undefended against the realities of pain and suffering, against disappointment and rage just as it is undefended against dignity and generosity, undefended against beauty, joy and love itself. I 
I feel I could use some help uh, exploring this third window of love and of trying to be helplessly loving. So I turn to the poet Naomi Shihab Nye. But before we turn here from her, some words of introduction by William Siegert in The Poetry Pharmacy. Thank you, Myron. There are times in life when everything we thought we could rely on fails and everything we have wanted for ourselves dissolves in front of us. There are times too when we are confronted with the same suffering in others, faced with the sheer scale of the misery in this world. It can be agonizingly difficult to engage meaningfully and all too tempting to harden our hearts against it. In her inspiring poem, Kindness, Naomi Shihab Nye tells us that such moments, hard as they are, are also opportunity, if we will only dare to open our hearts. For it is only by reckoning with true sorrow and desolation that we can come to understand how necessary, how life-preserving, kindness really is and move towards it. First, however, we must learn true empathy. Kindness, after all, is simply another word for love. And once we've acknowledged that the pain of others is exactly as searing as our own, what can we do but love them? As Nye so touch me suggests, Nothing else makes sense. Thank you for that. So now the poem itself, Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, what love really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go. So you know how desolate the landscape is between the regions of kindness. before you learn the gravity of kindness, of love, you must travel where the dispossessed refugee wrapped in salvaged rags lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how they too were someone who journeyed through the night with plans and with the simple breath that preserves life. Before you know kindness, love as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then. It is only kindness, only love that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. It is only kindness, only love that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it's you I have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. To be fair or to be kind or to be honest, I should acknowledge I did make a few very small changes to that poem, which I fervently hope that the poet would accept with kindness. 
So let us sing our last hymn. Just as long as I have breath, I must answer yes to life. The hymn number 83. So now our closing reflection, I'm going to ask you to, to say, if you wish to say, I'm going to ask you to say, there is hope whenever I say, in you, in me, in what we will, there is hope. In you, in me, in what we will, there is hope. In a voice raised against injustice. In a voice lowered to offer encouragement, in a voice silenced simply to listen, may we notice hope. In you, in me, in what we will, there is hope. In ears which listen with interest, in ears which listen with discernment, in ears which listen with compassion, may we notice hope. In you, in me, in what we will, there is hope. In a hand punching the air in excitement, in a hand waving in recognition, in a hand joining with another, may we notice hope. In you, in me, in what we will, there is hope. In eyes courageously open to life, in eyes honestly open to truth, in eyes tenderly open to tears. May we notice hope. In you, in me, in what we will, there is hope. In a mind which dares to be unmade up, in a mind which wonders what lies behind the obvious, in a mind which embraces the realities of other people. May we notice hope. In you, 
in me, in what we will, there is hope. And in a heart undefended against pain and sorrow, in a heart undefended against joy and delight, in a heart which can do no other than give and receive love, may we notice hope. In you, in me, in what we will, there is hope.